Okay. It means to disappear to yourself, to all your former ideas, your concepts of what who God is and all of that. Disappear, be dissolved into God like a drop of water, a raindrop into the ocean. And can you find that raindrop once it's dissolved into the ocean? Can you find it? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you, you can't. So you can't. You, if you went looking and people came up to you and you're in your little boat saying, I'm trying to find the raindrop I saw this morning, they'd think you were crazy. Well, you are crazy when you try to discover yourself once you've dissolved into the divine fear. It's craziness. Forget yourself. You no longer exist. The old you has been dissolved. Jesus did it, by the way. But he wanted your fiat because Jesus never does anything unless you give your free will to his act. You know, he doesn't force you. He seduces you. It's a beautiful word, seduce. He seduces you. Um, sometimes he pulverizes you like he had to do with me because I'm, I'm a hard-headed person or so I thought about myself. But anyway, anyway, it took decades. <laughs> My eldest son said something profound to me one day. He said, Mum, love transforms in decades. In decades. I never forgot it. That was long before I came into the divine will. And um, he said he said some other amazing things over the years. He's a very deep thinker, my eldest son. It's a shame he's not practicing his faith anymore, but he will one day. Um so you're dissolved, right? The old you no longer exists. You're a new creation. And what is this new creation? It's a divine life. It's a divine life that Jesus created through all his sufferings, sorrows, deaths, tears, prayers, love, love, love. His love recreated you into the divine life that you now are. Now, this divine life radiates his son, S-U-N, the son of his divine will. Now, you can't see it. So you see, Louisa, he said, Louisa said to him, oh, Jesus, you know, you're always saying all these, you know, incredible things and radiating the sunlight of your will, etc. He said, but when you and Our Lady were on earth, you weren't radiating the sunlight of your will. How come? Because you were the two great sunlight, you know, sons of the divine. And then he gave this long lesson explaining to her that the divine will suppressed on purpose the radiation of the sun that existed within him and Our Lady. Because if they revealed their true identity to souls that weren't ready at all to, you know, they would probably react in all various ways, you know, that human beings react to supernatural phenomena. 
So the the satellite of the divine will is is in you, even though it's not being revealed. Just believe it because Jesus says it. This is a this is a sanctity of faith in his words, in his truth. Believe it. So when you look in the mirror, you don't see this glorious sun shining out at you. <laughs> Oh, dear. You know, I am going, once I start, I can't stop. Sorry. <laughs> well, this is why for those people that are going to be listening to the recording, Geraldine was sharing some beautiful pearls and I thought off the cuff and I'm thinking, oh, James, we better record this because it's all beautiful, you know, before the prayer <laughs> meeting. So, darling, Geraldine, if you would like to start with the prayer, and then we will end with the Our Father and prayer for Louise's glorification. And next week I'll have it already on the screen and I'll ask different people to lead us in the Our Father and in the prayer for Louise's glorification. But this week we'll do it here. Mm. Thank you, darling Geraldine. Well, I'm going to read again what Jesus told Louisa in volume 11 the extraordinary um, words of Jesus so that each time I read them for you, just receive them as if Jesus is saying them to you. He's saying them to Louisa, but he's saying them to every soul who lives in him. Volume 11, March the 3rd, 1912. March the 3rd, 1912. Now, remember, for those newcomers, you know, that are new to the divine will, from volume one up to volume 11, Jesus is preparing Louisa in many varied ways by perfecting in her the sanctity of the virtues and then slowly preparing her to become the first soul stigmatized in the divine will. You see, so it's even in her, she of course was a was sanctified at conception, which is revealed in volume 19. So she was holy, but she had not yet come to live in the fullness of the sanctity of the divine will until a certain age. So what I'm going to read to you now is so beautiful. I want you to go into your heart and say, Jesus, I fuse my heart, my mind and my will into yours to receive these words that you are going to speak to me. I'll give you a moment to do that. So when you're receiving these words, because you're fusing yourself into Jesus, it's Jesus receiving the words on behalf of all humanity. So it's not just you hearing them. He's going to speak these words into every soul that's ever been created. He's going to knock on the door of every heart. He's going to open that heart if he can because it requires their fear, their disposition for these words to penetrate. So imagine yourself knocking on the door of every heart from Adam to the last and pouring into that soul these words of Jesus. Had I not created the heavens for you alone, I would create them. In you, I lay the heaven of my will. 
and I make you a true image of myself. And within you, I keep wandering about, amusing myself and playing with you. To you, I keep repeating, had I not left myself in the sacrament, for you alone, I would have done it. In fact, you are my true host. And just as I could not live without a will, in the same way, I cannot live without you. Heaven of my will. You are my true host, my Calvary, and my very life. You are more dear to me and more privileged than the tabernacles and the consecrated hosts. And now I'll pray our prevenient prayer for this uh, teaching on <clears throat> the eternal communions. O oh, Jesus, life of my soul, beat of my heart, love of my life. As I read this lesson, within which is a new heaven, a new creation, a new divine life of your beauty and bountiful self, Jesus, I pray that you infuse yourself into me, that I may become the wisdom of God, to receive in my mind all the truths you want me to embrace, that I may become the divine love with which to embrace them, and that I may become the divine sorrow to grieve over all the refusals of these sublime truths. So, Jesus, open my mind, open my heart and the very depths of my soul, that I may be consumed with your own ardours of love to receive all possible goods of our Father's heavenly will, that not only I, but all may come to know him in and through you, dear Jesus, in the love of your Holy Spirit. Now I will repeat to you this little quote from... Volume 17, October the 30th, 1924. Volume 17, October the 30th, 1924. <clears throat> One more knowledge about my will raises the soul to such a sublime height that the very angels remain stupefied and enraptured and they confess me incessantly, holy, holy, holy. So from the many things that I have manifested to you about my will, you can comprehend now what I want to make of you and how I love you and how your life must be a chain of continuous acts done in my divine will. And so now we're going to enter the sanctuary, the great liturgy of these divine truths 
we're only going to read one or two of them, but in each one are the whole of the eternal truths hidden in each one. So um, James can start reading now, and you are going to be listening in the divine will with the ears of the divine will. So it's not you listening. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're going to be listening with the ears of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, you don't worry ab about comprehending everything altogether all at once because the Holy Spirit will give you the understanding when you need it exactly at the right time. Up of page 26. The holy desire to receive Jesus makes up for not being able to receive Jesus sacramentally in such a way that the soul breathes God and God breathes the soul. From volume six, December the 5th, 1903. Since this morning, I could not receive communion. I was all afflicted, though resigned. And I thought to myself that if I had not been in this position of being bedridden and of being victim, I would certainly have been able to receive him. And I said to the Lord, you see, the state of victim subjects me to the sacrifice of depriving myself of receiving you in the sacrament. At least I accept the sacrifice depriving myself of you to content you as a more intense act of love for you. Because at least thinking that the very privation of you proves my love for you more, sweetens the bitterness of your privation. And as I was saying this, tears were pouring from my eyes. But, oh goodness of my good Jesus, as soon as I began to doze off, without making me wait and search for a long time, as usual, immediately he came. And placing his hands on my face, he caressed me and said, My daughter, Poor daughter, courage. The privation of me excites the desire more. And in this excited desire, the soul breathes God. And God, feeling more ignited by this excitement of the soul, breathes the soul. In this breathing each other, God and the soul, Thirst for love ignites more. And since love is fire, it forms the purgatory of the soul. And this purgatory serves her not as just one communion a day, as the church allows, but as a continuous communion, just as the breathing is continuous. But these are all communions of most pure love, only of spirit, not of body. And since the spirit is more perfect, as a consequence, love is more intense. This is how I repay, not one who does not want to receive me, but one who cannot receive me, depriving himself of me to content me. Now, the, the key word there is the last sentence. If you can't receive sacramental communion because of your circumstances and principally because of your desire to please Jesus more, 
Jesus says, deprives herself of me in order to please me more. See, deprives herself of me in order to content him more. So that is, that's when you receive the eternal communions, the continuous communions of his divine love. So, for example, if you are the carer of a seriously ill person or a dying person and you long to receive Jesus sacramentally, you're not deprived. Jesus is giving you continuous communions because in serving that sick person, in caring for that sick person, you're caring for Jesus. If you're living in the divine will, that is, you're fusing your acts of caring into his will so that a Jesus' divine love is ministering to that sick and dying person. But in that, because you can't go to Mass, because you can't receive sacramental communion, Jesus is not going to deprive you of himself, is he? He says here he's going to give you continuous communions by breathing his breath into your soul. Now, doesn't that make you feel happy? Doesn't it make you understand the love of Jesus? <laughs> The love of Jesus is so great, he doesn't deprive your soul when he knows your soul is desiring him. There are other reasons he explains in the Book of Heaven about um, to a mother who can't go to Mass because she's got to care for her all her children, her little children, right? She can't get to Mass. I wish I had have had this knowledge when I had five children all on, you know, all under a very young age. And I still strive to take them all to Mass. And, of course, they would all, my husband never came and I would have to try and look after the five children altogether and of course, some had run up on, run away up on the sanctuary. And then I remember one day at mass, I was, I just was broke down and started crying. <laughs> and said, Jesus, I can't, you know, it's so hard for me to do this. I want to be at mass. I want to bring up my children, you know, in the faith. But it's so hard when I, I wasn't particularly well either at the time. But if I had have known this truth back then, it would have given the understanding that Jesus was not going to deprive himself of me because I was a beleaguered mother of five little children, you know. So... He has this lesson in the book of heaven and he said to that mother, because she wants to be with me, she wants to be at mass, because she wants to receive me, I'm not going to deprive myself, deprive her of myself. So any of you out there who have duties with your family and other situations, that make it difficult for you, don't worry. Don't worry. Jesus never is going to leave you deprived of himself. He says so here. Write this lesson down and put it, stick it up on your wall of your bedroom or something to remind yourself that you're never going to be deprived of Jesus. So continue, James. Up to page 27. 
Every time the soul desires Jesus, she is reborn in him and he in her. From volume... There you go. <laughs> <laughs> From volume six. I don't know. You see, I don't need to talk. There, the, the whole, you know, the whole thing is so amazing. Like, it's he answers all our questions, you see. He's so kind. He's so good. Go on, James. From volume six, December 10th, 1903. Continuing in my usual state, I felt a weight over my soul, as if the whole world weighed upon me because of the privation of blessed Jesus. And in my immense bitterness, I did as much as I could to look for him. Then once again, he came and he told me, my daughter, every time the soul looks for me, she receives a divine shade, a divine feature, and is reborn in me as many times, and I am reborn in her. While he was saying this, I was thinking of what he had said, almost surprised, and I said, Lord, what are you saying? And he added, oh, if you knew the glory, the taste that the whole of heaven feels in receiving this note from the earth. A soul who constantly seeks God, all similar to them. What is the life of the blessed? What is it that forms it? Their being reborn continuously in God and God in them. This is the saying God is ever old and ever new nor do they ever feel tired because they are in continuous attitude of new life in god okay keep going james theresa's fusion with jesus after communion from volume 9 november the 4th 1909 having received communion I was saying to my adorable Jesus, I am now tightly united with you. Even more, I am identified with you. If we are one single thing, I leave my being in you and I take yours. So I leave you my mind and I take yours. I leave you my eyes, my mouth, my heart, my hands my steps or oh, how happy i will be from now on i will think with your mind i will look with your eyes i will speak with your mouth i will love with your heart i will work with your hands i will walk with your feet and if something comes to me i will say i left my being in jesus and I took his own. Go to Jesus, and he will answer you for me. Oh, how blissful I feel. Ah, yes, I take from you also your beatitude. Isn't it true, Jesus? But my life and my good. With your beatitude, you render all heaven blissful. While if I take your beatitude, I make no one blissful. And Jesus told me, My daughter, you too, by taking all of my being along with my beatitude, can make others blissful. Why has my being the virtue of beatifying? Because everything is harmony in me. One virtue harmonizes with the other. Justice with mercy, sanctity with beauty, wisdom with strength, immensity with depth and height, and so with all the rest. Everything is harmony in me, and nothing is discordant. These harmonies make me blissful, and I beatify all those who draw near me. 
So, as you take my being, be careful that all virtues harmonize among themselves. And this harmony will communicate beatitude to whomever draws near you. Because in seeing goodness, sweetness, patience, charity, and equality in everything in you, they will feel blissful being near you. Does anyone wish to um, comment on that? Geraldine? Geraldine? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. We can hear you, Vicky. Keep talking. What is the, yes. Okay, what is the yes, meaning Vicky. of the attitude? Yes, what is the meaning of the attitude? Beatitude, you know the word beauty. <clears throat> yes. Beatitude is is to make beautiful, but in a divine way. So, um, the beatitude of heaven is the absolute beauty of the divine attributes, which are reflected in the soul in heaven that's why they're called blessed the blessed of heaven because they reflect the beatitude of god himself so each one reflects the beatitude of god in a different way you know depending on <clears throat> what was their renowned virtues all the saints of course are perfect and as Jesus says here, their, their virtues harmonize together because you can't go to heaven unless you reach that state of perfect beatitude. That means you're reflecting the beauty of God. Therefore, Purgatory exists because the divine, the fire of divine love wants to perfect within every soul his beatitude. So if you are still lacking in that perfect harmony of virtues when you die, you need to go to purgatory in order for that harmony of virtues and the divine beatitude <clears throat> to be perfected in you. Now, having said that, Jesus says, if you live in my will, in its perfections, you will never go to purgatory because on earth, the souls that live in the divine will they live their purgatory on earth. Now, hands up anyone who's going to resign, <laughs> who's going to hand in their fiat. No. Now, this is, a, this is a sublime teaching that is very hard for newborns to grasp <clears throat> say you've suffered your whole life right say you have suffered in one way or another your whole life and then you come into the divine will and you realize that you're going to be required to suffer more <laughs> and you go oh Right, you know, so after the honeymoon period is over, because <clears throat> Jesus gives you a honeymoon, you know, where it's all so wonderful. And you think this is it, this, and I did too. I, I received an amazing honeymoon period when I was first given the gift of the divine will. And then, of course, I set myself to study the Book of Heaven. That was my one 
um, my, my, my primary work was to study the Book of Heaven. And then, of course, I realized about when you enter Jesus' divine humanity, you're going to need to embrace all of his sufferings. He's going to suffer in you. Now, there's the great difference because the suffering you had before coming into the divine will was a subjective suffering. In other words, it was suffering you felt according to the conditions of your life or your health or the people you lived with or whatever. There's subjective sufferings which no doubt you would have offered to God. You know, the nuns always said to us in primary school, offer it for the souls in purgatory. <laughs> <clears throat> and we um, we did that. But the suffering you're going to suffer in his humanity is his suffering. Don't forget you've disappeared, right? You don't exist any longer. Jesus is living in you and he wants to share his suffering with you. But when you say fear to that, what he does is an extraordinary miracle. He not only gives you his suffering, a share in it, by the way, a very small share, but he gives you a celestial joy. at the same time. So the suffering in the divine will is a purgation on earth, but it's accompanied with celestial joy because you love to suffer with Jesus because it's his suffering. All your subjective suffering goes out the window, gone forever. You don't, uh, love does not, it's in the St. Paul, love does not take offence. You know, read the litany of love. Love does not take offence. So when someone humiliates you, you don't get offended anymore, do you? It doesn't affect, you know, why doesn't it offend you? Because you don't exist. The old you, I mean. The new you exists, but the new you is fused into Jesus. So when someone insults you or humiliates you, you realise Jesus in you is receiving the insult and humiliation. Therefore, you quickly say, oh, my Jesus, I love you, that you've allowed me to share in your humiliation. And all of a sudden you see I remember this happened to me once. A woman got very angry at me and scratched my face with her long fingernails. And <clears throat> I was living in the divine will at the time and I was able, after I sort of recovered from the shock, um, I was able to say, Jesus, thank you for allowing my face to be scratched because it was bleeding. And then I remembered the scar on the face of Our Lady of Chester Hover, the two tracks of the scar remained on the painting. Our Lord showed me that in my soul and, and showed me that, you know, he was allowing me to share 
<clears throat> in all the offences given to the face of Jesus and Mary, and there are many, by the way, they're in, uncountable today. So <clears throat> if you're insulted or humiliated, it's a great blessing in the divine will. And you don't feel it. I'm telling you, I'm not making up a story. If you're truly living in the divine will, you, you actually don't feel the, the insult in a subjective way, right? You, you don't, um, because you've lost a sense of yourself. Now, <clears throat> The celestial joy you feel is that you're able to relieve Jesus from his suffering. So the more you're insulted, the more you suffer physically, morally, emotionally, the more you're criticised, the more you're abused, the better in the divine will for Jesus, the better for Jesus and the better for souls because when you do that, as, by the way, Our Lady did it and all the saints have done it in one degree or another, you're giving, <clears throat> you're creating a bank of divine graces for other souls. You, you give it to Jesus, you don't, count, you don't count the cost. Remember, love doesn't count the cost. You don't have to worry about where the fruits of your act are going to go because Jesus will give the fruits of that suffering to souls as he wills <clears throat> because you've been dissolved into him. And that is what you're giving to others, beatitude, you're giving others beatitude because you're willing, like Jesus, to be crucified to yourself. This is a core teaching in the divine will, by the way. If you're not welcoming suffering, you're not living in the fiat. If you're still complaining about anything, you're not living in the fiat. And I mean about anything. Because once you give your fiat, Jesus is in control of your life. And if he wants to give you sufferings and abuse and everything, it's him doing it because he, he lives in you in order to receive <clears throat> those sufferings. But by you sharing in them, you relieve him. That's your office. Your, <clears throat> excuse me. Your divine office is to relieve Jesus of his suffering. Geraldine, this is Steve. Do you mind if I tag in to exactly what you're talking about or do you want me to be quiet and you keep talking? <laughs> well, how could I tell you to shut up, Steve? <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> um, yeah, I love, so power I love hearing you too. Well, so powerful what you're just talking about right now. And I, with this whole last subject that you're dealing with, I was remembering when I was so ministered to with another passage in volume 11, and I just quickly looked it up that talks exactly about what you're speaking about. I'll offer it to anybody else if you want to look it up later, but it is um, March 8th, 1914 in volume 11. Okay. And it has to do with that whole subject of how Jesus is suffering in us. And I'll, I'll share with you something that, just goes to show how Jesus has always been trying to work this way in our lives in veiled ways. There's a friend of mine named Pat who's listening and she's on this Zoom right now and I won't. 
say anything more, but she had a precious brother who many years ago, um, this in the Holy Spirit, the Lord worked a charism or a gift, a grace in his life where he was able to pick up from other people different emotions or whatever that the Lord was impressing on his heart to minister or to pray for about. He might be in a grocery store and, and it was on the other side of the aisle. There was somebody else who was really going through something serious. He had no idea of any of this, but anyway, the Lord revealed this to him. And, and so he was able to pray. And then somehow later it would be confirmed. Well, the point that I'm getting in all of this is that that is only a microscopic look at the intent and the effect of what God wants to do in every one of our lives who are living in his divine will. And, it, and I'll just read this little passage, this one part of the passage where Jesus is saying, in fact, everything that creatures do to me reaches me even in the soul in whom I dwell, who does my will. So all of us who are seeking to live in God's holy will, whoever is hurting Jesus in any way, no matter what is going on, it touches Jesus in us. This is how Jesus is assuaged. This is how Jesus is touched, where we can take on that pain, that suffering, that injustice, um, that evil, whatever it is, that they're throwing the barbs at Jesus. And so he says, so if the coldness of creatures reaches me, my will feels it. And since my will is life of your soul, it happens as a consequence that you will feel it also. So instead of troubling yourself over this coldness as if it was your own, you must remain around me to console me and repair for the coldness that creatures are sending to me. In the same way, if you are feeling distractions, oppressions, and other things, remain around me to relieve me and to repair those who are not, let's see, excuse me, as if those were not her things, but mine. So you see, he's saying uh -huh. again, quit, quit looking yeah. at it as if it's all yours and you're suffering. You are taking that on for others. So yeah, that is so beautiful. Yeah, that is it, what I meant by it's no longer your suffering, your subjective suffering, because exactly. Jesus is living in you. You have mm -hmm. died to yourself in him, and therefore everything he gives you is a gift. It's yes. a gift. If he gives you coldness, hardness of heart, if he, well, for many years, that's how I, I don't have any nice, nice feelings. You know, I can't, cannot cry. I cannot. And Jesus it was such a relief to me to discover uh, in those readings, the ones you're reading in volume 11 and volume 12, that he's giving me the coldness that he feels in the hearts of others that are giving him the coldness of their hearts. He's not giving me the glories of the attitude. He's giving me the coldness that he feels from the hearts of so many creatures. So when we're giving these gifts, even when we feel as I feel, my heart is like a hard rock that has no divine sentiments. You know, it's, it's, very, it's a great suffering of Jesus to feel the hardness of hearts of even from his consecrated souls. You see? So he's going to mm -hmm. give it to you. He, it, that's what you read, Steve. He's right. feeling it. Yeah. And that's beautiful right. and, conversation, yeah. Right. And so if we are mature, 
then we are no longer subjective in all of this and looking at all of these things as if this is happening to me. Why am I feeling this? Why am I, I, I? We get out of this whole I because, yeah, we're lost in Jesus. And so I recognize maybe a heaviness of something that I'm feeling or something I'm seeing. And I recognize, oh, Jesus, this is you suffering that in me. And, and so then we get our mind completely off ourself and then I can embrace whatever that feeling is. And I just start pouring over a reparation and a love and, 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 and giving all of that right back to Jesus, to God. So it, it, it turns everything into an act of love. Everything. 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 Act, act everything. of love for Jesus. Everything. Yes. Yes. And, yes. And, and even, even if you're having a miserable day, um, which sometimes I have, um, it's the misery of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane where he couldn't even found it difficult to get up off his knees, you know, had difficult to walk to the apostles. He had to resort to even asking his apostles for assistance in his prayer. This is the divine son of God suffering. You know, so when you're struggling in your prayer, you can fuse yourself into the divine will and ask the assistance of the saints and angels of our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph and Louisa. Please help me in my prayer. I'm struggling. Because Jesus did that act in the garden. He, re- he, he experienced the complete dissolution of strength in his body because he was reflecting what it feels like for a sinner or someone contemplating suicide, for example, he felt the depth of human weakness within himself, but in a divine, a subjective way that a human being feels it like that, but he was feeling it and then experiencing it and divinizing it. You have something to say, John? I see your name up there on the, no? Yes. Yes, if you're, if you're done with the, your topic, Geraldine. If... Did you say you, you have, see these little hands up things? Yes, yes means... I would like to. Does that mean, I don't know where they are on my computer, but does that mean that you want to speak, does it? Yes, yes it does. Yes, um, yes, Geraldine. Oh, okay. All right. I'll leave it. Like raising, raising the hand in the classroom. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, John, go ahead, John. Thank you, Geraldine. Uh, I just took note of the title of this last excerpt we had, it's just Louisa's fusion with Jesus after communion. And so I guess took note of several things for myself to practice and I would like your comment about it. His, she says, having received communion, I was saying to Jesus. And so it pointed out to me personally what I should be doing having received communion. When I receive communion, and I think this, that would be the best time for me to pray this, to, to remember this, what Luisa was saying. So for me to be more alert, I mean, to be more consistent is after communion, I should be so focused on Jesus and only and nobody else as if I will not be thinking, oh, I will talk to that person after mass. Oh, I will learn. But I, that's one of my mistakes. I lose focus immediately. Having received, going back to my seat, then I forget that I have Jesus. I am supposed to be doing this to either, uh, uh, remind myself I am now tightly united with you. So I should take a second step. I should do something like an act. Like she says, 
I leave my being in you, Jesus, and I take yours. This is what I should be praying. I leave you my mind, I take yours. And so that's all. I am just making a resolution to apply this uh, when I when we go yes. to Mass and communion. Thank you. Yes, that's a very good point because at that particular moment is is the most sacred moment where Jesus is giving you the gift of his entire humanity and he wants that response from you. You've got to give him back the gift of your entire humanity and, and remain with him. At, you know, at least 15 minutes. Don't get distracted with other people or situations or whatever. It's just you and Jesus. And there's beautiful prayers in the hours of the Passion that I pray after I've received communion that um, reflect... Um, So here there's one prayer. It's at the end of the 8 p.m. hour and it, uh, it's a prayer I pray occasionally. I, there's so many prayers, you know, you, you choose the ones you, you like. My sweet love, in this hour you transubstantiated yourself in bread and wine. Oh, Jesus, please grant that everything I say and do may be a continual consecration of yourself in me and in souls. My sweet life, when you enter into me, grant that my every heartbeat, desire, affection, thought and word may endure your sacramental consecration in such a way that with my entire being, tiny, with my entire tiny being consecrated, it may become so many hosts to give you to souls. And by virtue of your consecration, O oh Jesus, may I consecrate all of you into all souls. O oh, Jesus, my sweet love, may I be your tiny host in order to enclose within myself as within a living host your entire being. So this is what I pray in my, my hours of the passion. I mark the things that are prayers and I use these first hours of the institution of the Holy Eucharist and I pray all three hours in, in, within the Mass itself. But if you, if you can't do that, you can select a passage like that at the moment of the consecration. You unite with Jesus. My sweet love, in this moment, you transubstantiated yourself, see? And you become, you're with Jesus. And the words of Jesus prayed by the priest are being prayed over you, you see? So that you become a living host, so that you can give yourself to all humanity, all humanity. Beautiful. So the prayers that are prayed in, and then after communion, I pray the final hour in the hours of the Passion, when Jesus, uh, our Blessed Mother, has to leave the sepulchre, right? Now, Jesus is dead, and she is finding it difficult to leave the sepulchre. So the only way that she can leave the body of Jesus because it was a crucifying, a crucifying act. And, and she says, and I pray 
I pray this, see how I've got it all marked in my hours in, which um, John is, is similar to what, you know, Louisa prayed, but I pray it from the heart of my mother. And, and Louisa is saying, my sorrowful mother, as I weep, I pray you to not let Jesus be taken from my side, our side. First, let me enclose myself in him to make his life my own. If you, the immaculate, the all holy, the full of grace, cannot live without Jesus, how much less can I, who am sinful, weak, full of misery, how can I live without Jesus? Take me with you. So then it goes on right through. And what Louisa is doing, she's uniting with our blessed mother who finds it so difficult to separate from the humanity of Jesus now dead. So she fuses herself into Jesus' soul, we feel, after we've received communion, we don't want Jesus to leave us to ourselves. We want him to remain with us the rest of the day and the rest of our life. So these are little um, ways we can develop our daily rounds of love because Louisa has already done it and the prayers are there as we've read in the, the, the prayer of Louisa this morning, after communion. But that wasn't the only prayer she prayed after communion. She varied it. She multiplied its beauty. She grew. But she always was appealing for Jesus to inhabit her as a living host. So this is what we must do after communion. And we must pray as Louisa prayed, as Jesus prayed in her. This is what we must learn to do. If we're going to live in the divine will, we have to practice this way of praying. So um, we're consecrating that prayer that John just read or we just read. Um, she wants to give Jesus her mind. So his mind uh, radiates in hers, her eyes, her mouth, her heart, her hands, her steps. Anyway, we can go on now, James. Uh, how are we going for time? It might be good, Geraldine, because it's already 11 past six. Maybe if we stop the sharing from the book and maybe people got a few questions for the next 15 or so minutes, please. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's wonderful. Who's got a question they'd like to ask Geraldine? Please. Wow. <laughs> Usually the sound is not loud. <laughs> um, there's a lady there on her iPhone. Hey, Joel. I don't want. To... Okay, Joel, go for see, it. See that one? Okay. What's okay. your name, right. darling? Joel. 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 Oh, Joel. Hello, Joel. Hello. Hi. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, in the suffering in the divine will, I know it is Jesus in me who is suffering. But come to the point where do we actually teach others that what they are saying is actually not right? about the faith, no. about the church, no, no, about no. Jesus? No, no. Oh, you mean no. teach others who live in the divine will or teach anyone? No, 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 no. Those who are actually hurting Jesus in me. Oh. About the faith, oh, about... No, no. No, they won't understand it, no. You don't ever explain to someone... Who who is assaulting Jesus in you? What they're doing? You don't. No, they don't know that. They don't know that. They don't know what no. I am doing. But because 
I know myself I'm suffering and I know Jesus suffers in me. But yes. when they are talking against the faith, against Jesus, against it is, isn't it my duty to teach? Be very careful because it's your soul who actually is suffering here. You cannot talk about against the, the faith. You don't talk against uh, God that way. No. Or do I just stay quiet? No, there are moments, of course, Jesus will tell you when to speak. Now, if you, you've prayed the hours of the Passion, have you prayed the Hours of the Passion book? I have before. No, not, oh, yes, yes, of course, yes. yes. But so not today, the, not today. <laughs> no, no. But in the Hours of the Passion, there were moments when Jesus responded and there were other moments when he remained silent. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. there's an interesting uh, observation of this in the gospel of redemption when when in the hours of the passion where jesus was taken to herod's palace right and he was clothed uh, ridiculed and clothed as a madman mm -hmm. and jesus never spoke one single word in response to Herod. And I yeah. pondered on this for many years, you know, to others, even to Pontius Pilate, he responded very, very succinctly, but he responded. And I said, why, when you're in the presence asking him, you know, Jesus will tell you, Joel, if you ask him, <laughs> he will mm -hmm. tell you when to respond, when not to respond. And Jesus answered in my soul, purity never responds to lust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Purity never engages in a dialogue with lust. Mm -hmm. And because Herod's questions were not meant to obtain true knowledge, of course, they were just asked out of pure curiosity. So there are moments when it is not pertinent to respond to certain people because the cloud of deception that covers them is recognised in the particular addiction they have. So you know that it's not going to benefit you to try and instruct someone who's drunk or on drugs or immersed in a lustful addiction. It's a useless waste of time. And Jesus himself demonstrated this in the gospel itself, the gospel of redemption. There were certain people he did not respond to. There was no point. So it's not your duty to instruct people that are regaling against the faith if they are regaling against it in a, in a manner that is hateful. Even our Lord said, wipe the dust off your feet once, you, once they've rejected the faith. Our Lady, when she came in all her apparitions, she didn't instruct us to instruct others in the faith. She said she gave us the method, and it's through prayer, penance, adoration. But in the divine will, we have a far greater uh, ability because it's Jesus praying in us. It's not us praying anymore. It's not us adoring anymore. It's Jesus in us doing the acts of his Father. Now, Joel, what you've expressed is a is coming from the teaching of the sanctity of the virtues. 
it's very hard for us to start shifting our our um, our ideas to this new sanctity. But Jesus is our model, and Jesus did not always speak or teach or correct. He sometimes was dead silent because he could see the soul of the person he was speaking to. Now, if you get a Holy Spirit inspiration that um, if you correct someone in the appropriate manner, it might help them, by all means do it. But because I'm not, um, I can't respond for every particular person or situation, but there are certainly times when correction is needed, even if you don't get the appropriate response. But at least uh, operating on the church's teaching, at least you have awakened your brother or sister, you know, to a divine reality. But you know that it's up to sanctifying grace and your acts in the divine will that will give the grace to that person to change. They're not going to obviously change instantly, but at least you have fulfilled uh, that duty. However, in the divine will, if we're truly allowing Jesus to live in us, we will, he will tell us when to remain silent and we'll, when to speak. Uh, but you, the, the main thing is practice allowing him to live in you, okay? Practice, do your rounds constantly, your acts of love in him, and he will, he will guide you to the appropriate response to people. Okay. And, and Geraldine, since Thank I you. brought this, yes, yeah, okay. since I brought this up, now I feel compelled that I better clarify something so that, that it wouldn't be misunderstood. And that is because um, I know how we can tend to think about these kind of things that we just read in volume 11 or that I read, that when we're suffering these things, many times this is what Jesus is experiencing. And so we're, we're actually having that emotional or physical or whatever distress or feeling, et cetera. You know, we have to use common sense. We have to know we have to use the Holy Spirit in all of this. I suppose if we were all living in the fourth degree, probably most all of our experiences would generally, yes, be very much a reflection of what Jesus is doing in us. But since I don't know who is in the fourth degree, and I'm certainly not, many times that which I am suffering is my own problems, is my own weakness, is my own thought of lust or anger or whatever unrested emotion or whatever is going on and that wasn't jesus that's steve steve has a problem here but where i find the comfort in this passage is that jesus is refreshingly allowing me to realize that many times no it's jesus that's suffering this so sometimes let's just take an example there's a lustful kind of a thought or feeling or whatever that's kind of coming over well need to kind of check, was that something that I allowed to kind of come in and allowed, and it's, it's my own, or is this something that came out of nowhere, and I, and I have kind of an oppression with this thought? Well, I think that the right way for me to handle it and what I do is if it's something for me, I simply give it to you, Lord. I give this negative, whatever it is, to you, Jesus, because I look for your complete healing within me, Lord. I want to be transformed entirely into your will and that there's nothing of my human will on this. And so I give it to you and I love you and I praise you. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in my life. But if it's something that I don't sense or there's anything that I gave myself to, perhaps that's something that the Lord is allowing me to suffer because it's something that is paining him from others. And so then I embrace that. And then my whole thought and intent is one then of compassionating Jesus. Yes, oh Lord, how that pains you as it does me right now and I feel it. And so I give you all my love. I give you my heart, Lord, because I feel that very pain too. But either way, it's resolved. But, but we're looking at 
I don't want, I, I shouldn't think that anyone should walk away and feel that everything that they're feeling is what Jesus is, because then we're not being responsible with our own thoughts, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. But you yes. generally know when it's you. Right. Right. <laughs> you generally right. know it's your reaction. And so if it's your re reaction, uh, the, the uh, act is still the same. Oh, Jesus, I fuse my, my anger into you to be dissolved. You Amen. do it immediately. And then it's dissolved immediately, you know. It's the reaction. You will know if it's you. I can tell you. There's a great, there's a great difference if you know that you're acting uh, according to your human reactions. Your energy. Hi, Thomas. Uh, you're entertaining it, but you're entertaining it. You know, it's your feelings. But I'm entertaining and, it. Uh, right. Perfectly put, Thomas. <laughs> because if it's a human uh, a, a human uh, response to some situation, you tend to wallow in the mud of it. You entertain it, as you say. You kind of get down there and, you know, oh, why did she do that? And should I have, you know, responded? You entertain it. That's a perfect answer, Thomas. Thank you for that. Beautiful short deceit. <laughs> Has anyone else got? Yeah, I love, I love it. it. Reminds me of my beautiful husband. <laughs> um, shall we now close with an Our Father and pray for beatification? If anyone's got a burning question that we can answer in about 30 seconds. No. <laughs> Five minutes. <laughs> Let's be generous. Six minutes. Anyone got a question? No, so we'll close with the prayer of the Our Father. And who would like to lead us in praying the Our Father? That's easy. I will. Okay, thank you. I will. In thank the name you. of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, okay. hallowed be thy name. Okay. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Um, who would like to lead us in the prayer for the glorification of Louisa? How about Mary Pat? I will. Okay, who is it? Please? I will. Thank you. you, would, would you okay. would, <clears throat> o Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise and thank you for the gift of holiness of your servant, Louisa Picaretta. Heavenly Father, she lived in your divine will under the action of your Holy Spirit and in conformity with your Son, who was obedient to death mm -hmm. on the cross. She became your pleasing victim and host, and thus cooperated in the work of redemption of all humanity, her virtues of faith, obedience, and humility, and her love for Christ, your son, and his body, the church, prompt us to ask you for the gift of her glorification on earth. Through Louisa, may your glory shine before all and your kingdom of and truth, kingdom of justice truth. and peace justice. and love spread over the whole world in the charism of fiat, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that through Louisa's sharing in your son's merit, we may obtain from you, Father, the particular grace we seek. Kingdom come on. With the intention of fulfilling your divine will, Amen. Via. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, especially Geraldine. It was beautiful. Geraldine. Uh, my Thank pleasure. You. Yes. Thank you, Geraldine. So Thank you. 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 Thank you.